Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. In this workshop, we're going to be discussing how to build and upskill your DevOps teams. Um, last year, DASA released a competency framework. So we are going to talk about uh, what that is, why we built it, and give you a bit of context around, uh, around that project. Then we're going to spend a good chunk of time doing a sample assessment that we built, looking, looking at the results of that sample assessment and discussing what to do with them. Then we're going to wrap it up uh, with the topic of measuring impact, because when we assess skills and competency, we want to do something with it. But then we also need to figure out if that's something paid off in a meaningful way so that we can continuously improve. My name is Andrea Tucker. I hold a PhD in educational sciences. My primary research areas are in skills and competency development and educational technologies. Today, I work for a tech provider in the learning space. Uh, I have been working with DASA on their learning strategy for the last two years, and I am joined by my team member, Sam. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Sam Rosberger. I've been in, uh, IT, in IT ops as a manager for over 17 years. Uh, what I do is I help organizations transform uh, to be more lean and hopefully be future proof. Uh, and I've been associated with DASA working for them or giving trainings uh, for DASA related subjects or even speaking at events uh, for DASA for over five years now. Uh, we've worked, uh, Andrea and I worked on uh, this uh, competency framework and we're very, very, very excited to uh, do this demo or workshop with you. We have a couple of people saying that there's some issues seeing the screen. Is that a unique issue or are, are other people having this problem as well? As I see it, just want to do a double check here. Can you drop in the chat? Thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm able to see the screen. No, it works. We can see it. Perfect. All right. Thank, thanks, guys. Sound like sounds like it might be a unique connection issue. Cool. All right. Um, OK. So time for a little bit of context uh, around the competency framework and how we built it but first we're going to kick it off with a poll so poll should be up are you currently in a digital transformation or are you considering it after you answer, feel free to drop some context in the chat while we uh, and while we wait for those answers to come in. Sam, can you tell us a little bit about what's going on in the world of DevOps and, and digital transformation? Yes, thank you. Um, well, we hear a lot of talk about digital transformations failing. Um, these reports by McKinsey and Forbes uh, also same are telling the same story, right? Um, so what? is what what are ma the main issues that these transformations fail well um first off uh, if you look at conway's law right uh, it says that the more complex an organization is the more complex uh, your product or service will be um and yeah this is a rule of thumb that that still applies so we have very complex organizations and we have very uh, complex products and we don't know where to start transformations the first thing that we tried is just reorganize, 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 reorganize. Uh, people um, are getting tired of changing all their uh, positions, their uh, jobs, their titles, whatever. Make, create your own titles is something that I had to do uh, at one of the opportunities I work for. Um, so it's very much unclear. Um, so what we tried to do is, okay, we, we reorganize and that didn't work. So the second thing that we tried is, okay, maybe if we just uh, create an easier product or easier to deliver uh, service, right? Do the shift and look from uh, look at it from a product type of uh, view. And this also failed um, because mainly what we now see is that we need these two tracks to be done simultaneously. And of course, also now there's a massive movement taking uh, culture more into account, right? We're looking at, okay, we're more uh, hiring for culture than for skills. So uh, that's an important part to, to integrate as well. So now we're looking at three tracks that you need to be successful in these transformations. And of course, the fourth one is the one that we're talking about now, 
um, the up and reskilling of your personnel. Uh, if you look at it very uh, at the very very end of this up upskilling reskilling is a way to uh, entice your personnel and to keep them uh, uh, motivated and also create an atmosphere where they can actually perform right as as humans we like to get that pat on the back right like oh you're doing a great job or get that <clears throat> get that feeling of appreciation for your teammates the only way we can make this possible is you know by 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 uh, arming these these employees and your team members and maybe even your leaders with uh, the right incentives and the right uh, learning paths and the right learning tools because uh, we see that you know we should look at okay what are the business drivers for your uh, for your organizations what are the goals and business outcomes you know who's affected um, what new processes do we need to learn are there uh, like for instance AI ops machine learning is really really booming right now how can we incorporate this into our uh, into our organization what are the best practices how do we up and reskill our personnel on these fields right uh, do we do we just follow uh, stuff on the internet just watch some videos have somebody uh, do some short recaps read white papers how do we do it uh, the same thing uh, is same thing applies to tools and technologies right we test something um, and maybe we learn something from it and how do we share these goals how do we map this 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 valuable information and how do we look at skill levels and how can we help organizations teams and individuals to 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 map this clearly um because you know it does not only change the 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 structure or the way of working or the culture does not only change in you know job roles it it changes in uh in individuals and eventually hopefully it leads to a multi-skilled team you know that has all the skills in place to do the support for a products or a, a website or a dedicated part of a website like for instance uh let's say search function on a website um so what we need is an overview of the competencies and skills per employee um, and let's let's just agree to use this for the good of the people and not use it as a like a stick to beat your uh, your uh, employees with in a performance review right this is all help to to up and reskill your teammates and and get some overview on what we're trying to achieve as a team yeah. Yeah. and what the skills are that you need to do this Oh, Sam, uh, Sam yeah, looks like on everyone was muted. Let's see if we can unmute him. So. All right, you're back. Okay. Um, okay, so the impact of the change. Um, so what changes the job title uh, the responsibilities you know technical capabilities change uh, core capabilities change and uh, what i personally like about dasa is that we do most of the stuff uh, according to the six principles that we have um, and we're really a unique party in the world because uh, we we tend to focus more on the cultural and soft skill part of the devops and uh, skilling and uh, devops transformations and uh, that's why that's one of the reasons why I really uh, like being associated with DASA. Um, oh, which I think I've uh, muted myself again. Did I mute myself? No, you're good. No, you're good. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, I, I use my space bar and I, sometimes it mutes me. So uh, I might be, uh, just give me feedback when I get muted. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we used to have the, the competency model uh, and this spider web should be uh, should be known by a lot of people. We have this uh, this test on the website that you can use, right? And um, it shows gaps uh, in your uh, skill sets. Now, at a co a certain companies or a couple of companies, is that we used that individual test, and then had a whole team do it, and then map this overview to the two B situation of a team, 
and then you know look at okay uh, what are the as well sorry that's the as is situation and now we're looking at okay if we want to do this app or this development in the future what are the skills that we think we need and that's a to be situation right from there you do you do a gap analysis and you can look at uh, missing skills but this is on a high over level so this doesn't really help you um, start your journey it has it's, it's, a, it's an easy uh, way to do some uh, collaboration or some check on the collaboration of your team what are the skills that are needed but what we saw as a working group is that we really need a deep dive in all these individual skills uh, so we can actually have some sort of map in the uh, in the skill uh, path of our individuals and our teams. So time for another poll. And before we dive into it, I just want to share that 68% uh, of you are actively undergoing transformation, which is a lot of you who are at risk for having a failure in your transformation. If we're not thinking about uh, some of the some of the things. Uh, related to upskilling, upskilling our teams and ensuring that we have the right ways of working in, in place. Another 23% of you are considering it, um, and only four of you today are not considering it. So maybe some of you have already done it and you're like, we're good, I'm happy. Um, but that doesn't mean we can let go of, of some of these talent and upskilling initiatives, right? One of the DevOps principles is, is continuous improvement, and we have to hold on to that uh, always. So with that, we do have a new poll for you guys. And my question is, are you currently struggling with talent retention issues? Now, this can be talent retention in terms of uh, are you having trouble hiring people or talent retention in terms of we have people leaving and difficulty replacing them, that sort of thing. So very curious to see to see what this looks like for you guys. And the results are the results are slowly coming in. Okay, so so it's, it looks like about 70% of you, again, you are struggling with talent retention issues. So no, some of this information may not be new to you. Um, we have 21% who are not presently struggling with talent retention issues. Uh, but you you never you never know, right? The world is changing. So. According to a report from the World Economic Forum, um, demand for IT skills is going to continue to rise with a need for 3.12 million additional IT practitioners to meet market need between now and 2030. And that means that we need to be thinking not only about the people we have in seat now, but we also need to be thinking about how our organization's talent strategy uh, is is going to be able to meet those future needs, right? So we hire or we train, those are usually the two choices that are offered to us. And it's actually six times more expensive to hire someone new than it is to train someone who is already in the organization. And we also know that organizations who invest in that training are more likely to be high performing organization. And this is investment in learning programs, coaching, mentoring, peer to peer training, uh, memberships in organizations. Only 12% of those low performing organizations make these same investments. So somewhere in there, learning and talent development paid off for these, these companies. And the question is, how is that? There was a piece of research that came out uh, back in 2019, and it showed that 50% of training created in most organizations is, is actually ineffective. So only half of what L&D practitioners are doing, half, only half of the training that you're buying is actually having an impact. And I'd love to know what you guys think of that. Like drop, drop in the chat, um, what do you guys think makes learning and training effective or ineffective based on based on your experience i do yawn i will need to pull it back up but i'm happy to share it when these these slides get shared out i believe it was a pwc study that that last one but what do you guys think what do you, what do you think makes learning effective or ineffective All right, Peter, sharing a list of definitions is key. That's probably related to a little bit performance support, right? Things you can refer back to. Mm -hmm. 
you'll be amazed on how many trainings I, I start off with and I ask, okay, are you forced to be here in the training or do you actually want to be here in the training? And uh, the answer is, is, is like maybe 20% of the times people just say, yeah, I have to be here for, uh, because uh, the company thinks I need this, uh, this certification to do my job. Um, so if you look at that's already undermining the, the thing that you're trying to achieve, right, with the training. Uh, and makes it less uh, less effective by itself already. It's it's it's, it's definitely around twenty percent for me. Uh, so hopefully, you know, if you if you are a trader uh, and you are facing this issue, that you know, hopefully, you'll have a way to drag them into the training and make it interesting for them. Um, but yeah, that's what I usually try to do um, to just up this percentage, right? We as a trainer. Uh, or as a teacher or as a peer programmer or whatever, uh, in any role, teaching somebody to do their work uh, more efficiently or better or even in a more fun way, you know, this can help this uh, effectiveness uh, rate go up. Absolutely. And I'm seeing a lot of other great answers in here too, right? Lack of time. Um, yeah. The people inside are too, too varied. It doesn't fit the goal of either the individual or the organization. Um, it's not targeted enough. Uh, mm -hmm we don't have any sort of practical application yeah all, all of these things are are dead on and i think we've all been in an experience where we've we've gone to a training maybe we were forced to be there or we've gone to a training maybe we were excited to be there and in the end it didn't do it didn't do much for us right and that's the kind of situation that we want to to make sure that we're avoiding um so there there are a couple of reasons right it's not continuous um but we are human, right? We use it or we lose it, which means that the format is wrong, right? We need guided learning, we need ongoing support, and we absolutely need real world application. And then sometimes it's just not focused enough, right? We're there for the wrong reasons. It's coming at the wrong time or we're focused on the wrong things. So that context, both for the individual and the organization are so, so important. And you might remember from that, that slide that Sam showed a little bit uh, earlier associated with the, the different pieces that we want to think through in a, in a transformation, right? What are your business drivers? What are the goals of the business outcomes? Who is affected? What is affected? Uh, all of that, all of that needs to be taken into into account as we're thinking about the upskilling programs that we put into place. But there's also a scalability issue here, right? Work needs to get done, and we need to be able to onboard, upskill, and provide development opportunities. It's it's a lot. Um, so that is one of the reasons that we decided to build the competency the competency framework um, and why the, a competency framework can be so valuable they can help with that focus and provide structure to learning and development initiatives in a way that can make them scalable make them impactful for individuals but also for teams and organizations and the structure of the DASA competency framework is built based on research in educational sciences, uh, including professional didactics, as well as experience working with human resources and talent professionals. Um, the content of the framework itself, so that's sort of the framework, but the content of the framework was established with input of experts in DevOps transformation, uh, industry leaders like many of you here, uh, and engineers with extensive experience in DevOps environments. So the working group that Sam and I are part of focused really on uh, this framework, uh, leveraging our own experience, as well as benchmarking against top organizations who have successfully implemented uh, DevOps and digital transformations versus those who were not as successful, right? The majority that failed. We tried to figure out what, what was the delta and put that in place as we built out this, this competency framework. So, what is it exactly? So we've sort of talked about it, we've talked about it vaguely, but what is it exactly? So a competency framework is a tool that defines the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and attributes that are needed by people so that they can act within a particular situation. In this case, the situation is their day job within the context of a DevOps environment. And this particular framework has three primary areas all of which have been mapped to indicators. And these indicators are made up of the theories, behaviors, or traits, which allow us to assess mastery in the given competency area. Basically, the things that we look for to know if somebody has this. 
has this particular competency. There are three competency areas that we had included uh, in this framework. The first is the DASA DevOps principles. Um, this is something that we consider to be important for all organizations uh, in order to have a digital transformation be successful. This includes things like end-to-end -end responsibility, automate everything you can, uh, and create with the end in mind. The next part is the, those core competencies. These are the foundational pieces of knowledge and behaviors that are required to work within a team, such as collaboration or self-regulation, right? These are necessary for anyone who is working cross-functionally. And within the framework, we have defined them in terms of what that means in a DevOps environment. Finally, we have the technical capabilities that are attached to given job roles. Um, this could be security, cloud architecture, reliability engineering, continuous testing, continuous integration, et cetera. Now, with, within these teams, to some extent, everyone needs a basic level or at least an understanding of what these are in order to be able to operate as a team. Right, your, um, your project manager, project leader, whatever you call it within your organization needs to have an understanding of what these things are and how they contribute to the, to the project, for example. But your test automation engineer needs a more in-depth knowledge and ability to execute on tasks related to some of these more technical areas. Um, Sam, yeah. can I pass it over to you to walk us through the yeah. competency framework for the test automation engineer as an example? Yes. Thank you for that pass. Okay, so um, if you're looking at this, uh, the top row, um, the family is DevOps engineering, the position is test automation engineer, it's, it's in the bottom left, uh, top left, sorry. Um, and what we did is we did an overview of the overall scores that are required uh, for, for instance, the left one technical capabilities, right? So the overall score should be 2.4 and to to explain this to you. Uh, level one is the beginner, level two is the intermediate, and level three is the expert. So we're looking at intermediate to expert expertise needed in the technical capabilities for a test automation engineer. For instance, if you look at DevOps business de uh, management, uh, one of the things uh, that- One it, of the things that- it, Sorry, sorry yeah, yeah, I hear an echo. Hear an echo. Okay. Uh, one of the things that a test automation engineer does not necessarily need a lot of uh, expertise in is, for instance, program management. You just need a beginner level understanding of being a part of a program uh, or a project uh, and at least uh, understand your position there and that, you know, there's a, a chunk of work that's uh, required to be done at the end of a given period. Um, the same thing for self-regulation, for instance, if you look at, you know, it, for a test automation engineer, uh, we have determined that it's very, very important to have curiosity at the, at the highest level, right? And not saying be the expert in being curious, but at least, you know, have that, have that uh, way of thinking, a way of working inside your, in, in your personality to, to look at better solutions to automate testing, right? Uh, to be involved in the work field, to watch some videos or, or check out new tools or test the new tools for testing even, you know? Uh, it's very important that you have some grit and persistence, right? If you test something uh, and you, even if you have an automated test pipeline somewhere and uh, yeah, it doesn't work as expected, you know, it would be nice for you to have the mindset, to just keep on plugging to into or like working at it to solve uh, whatever issue uh, is has has uh, occurred. So we've mapped this for 13 roles um, and uh, about uh, the total is about 50, no, it's 56 skills. So this is really what we thought was needed in organizations to really have a good look at all these you know, technical capabilities, these DevOps values, uh, self-regulation and the other, uh, some of the other soft skills, and even taking into account some of the leadership um, capabilities, competencies, and skills that you should have as, as an engineer, for instance. Um, 
because we think it's very valuable that even if you're not a leader, that you at least have some of these leadership, uh, you know, capabilities or skills. Uh, we're hoping that, you know, we have multi-talented uh, and multi-skilled teams where sometimes you just perform a leadership role on your technical expertise, for instance, or the, you know, have a leadership role in mentoring people, something like that. Okay, so we have some additional resources. Uh, we have the DASA competency framework explained. Uh, if you look at the core values, for instance, like customer-centric action, and it shows a definition and what are indicators of, of the things that we try to uh, measure or that we are trying to achieve with, these, uh, with this core value. Um, we also, if you look at technical capabilities, it's the same. You know, what is the definition according to DASA of security? For instance, you know, take action to plan and carry out security measures to monitor and protect data and systems. And what are what could be indicators in this field? And I want to take a slight detour here and hope this works with the sharing. Um, this shows um, the total explanation and it's about, uh, it's very um, complete. So it describes all of the um, uh, DASA six uh, principles, right? But it also looks at competency uh, families and explains everything. Then we also have the, the framework, the competency framework for recruitment, for instance, and it looks at what are the roles, what are the, the questions that you could possibly have during recruitment, uh, what the hiring policy should be, uh, you know, and if you look at this, for instance, there are for technical capabilities, even sample questions provided, uh, like, okay, um, technical capabilities are uh, uh, you know, like questions are, what does a reliability engineer do? Or do you have examples of why this is uh, successful? So even that is something that we thought about for the practical uh, usage of this, uh, of this competition framework. Okay, if you look at the high value competencies of a test automation engineer. Sam, uh, I'm, I'm having trouble seeing your screen again. Um, okay. Maybe I'll switch and try sharing. And then if, if, that's, sure. if that's not working, we'll, we'll work something out. But. Okay, sure, I'll stop share. Perfect. Share. All right, there we go. Um, and just to answer some of the questions in the chat, these documents are available on uh, on the DASA website. Okay. All right. Um, so yeah, yeah, here we go again. Uh, so if you look at the high value competencies of a test automation engineer, um, these are uh, the, the highest ranking ones. Um, you know, in self-regulation, it's a uh, continuous self-improvement, uh, for instance, or time management and uh, contributions. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, now I have the lag as well in the presentation, so that's interesting. Okay, and this is the total uh, overview of all the skills required in a graphical uh, res representation for the test automation engineer. So again, um, if you think this is, is uh, relevant to you, then please get in touch with us. Uh, we're looking, uh, yeah, we're really looking at uh, practical uh, application of this uh, in some environments. So, Please get in touch with us. Uh, and now that I can see the chat again, um, you know, I can be more interactive with your questions. And I think I saw a question somewhere uh, since a long time ago. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. One second. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We're going to get into the scan. Yeah. Let's do this. I'm just going to go back so I can see the whole chat because I'm in a thing. Still getting used to this. Okay. Sorry, guys. 
Um, so a few heads up as we start this uh, assessment. Uh, first, we have limited the, sc the scope of the scan, believe it or not, because when you, I put it in front of you, um, you, you might be shocked. But we wanted to uh, limit it a little bit for the purposes of this walkthrough. Uh, it's also not really role specific, so so that you know you could see one general uh, question within each area to get a feel for what's inside of the competency framework or how it can be used. Um, but we will talk, we'll continue talking through the example of the test automation engineer. Um, so despite the broadness, think of this as an initial assessment that covers a wide range of items as quickly as possible. Um, that then allows us to sort of zero in on key areas that need further refinement. But the assessment is not the end goal, right? The assessment is just the method. So following this assessment, we would likely have other additional assessments um, that have been designed into the Talent Academy. So uh, focus on a single skill area as a self-assessment. Um, others are, uh, are formative assessments, which means that they're looking uh, into how you're uh, adapting within the training program, um, getting an idea of your progress and gaps in your progress versus the material you should have gone through. Um, and then others are summative assessments. So we can see if you've you know, achieved mastery in a given area. So for example, as part of the DASA leadership uh, course, the summative assessment is in the form of actually building a digital transformation plan for your organization. Uh, but before we put someone into a program where the end goal is building a transformation plan, right? We need to make sure that it's it's relevant, right? Right time, right place. Um, so rather than diving into advanced technical questions on round one, uh, it's good to start a bit broader and then hone in based on gaps and team needs. So this one is going to be that broad categorization. So a couple of things I am going to try to share into the chat here a link to a Google Doc, so everyone should see that. And then in addition, I am going to put in a, uh, an Excel file. There are some, I know there are some organizations that block, um, that block docs, so there is also an Excel file that you can download to walk through the competency scan with us. So I'm just gonna give everyone a second to open that up and take a look at it. Now, on the left-hand side, you'll see the competency areas, um, the competencies, and then a question. And on the right-hand side, you'll see check boxes with a scale of never, rarely, sometimes, and always. So we're going to go. We're going to take the time today, and we're going to go through these questions, uh, each of them, and you'll be scoring yourself based on uh, how often you perceive that you take the actions described. And this is this is one way that you can apply this sort of competency competency assessment out of many. Um, but how often do you do this thing when a situation arises? So, for example, when there's a chance to innovate, how often do you have the courage to take the risk? Never, rarely, sometimes, or always. Um, for those of you who are using the Excel, you will need to double click to, to check it, uh, just as, a, as an FYI. Um, you will only check uh, one that applies, right? So just answer one per line, uh, or you might break your results of my poor little Google Sheet. <laughs> Tried real hard here, guys, <laughs> so don't, don't break it. Um, so just one per line. So we're going to go through, we're going to read the questions together one at a time, so don't feel the need to start rushing ahead. As we read them, we'll drop in some context for you um, and go with your gut reaction, right? What's your gut reaction to this? Don't try to overthink it. So Sam, um, why don't I let you kick us off with the DASA DevOps principles? And I thought it would be fun, Andrea, um, for the people that are interested and have one of these 13 predefined roles that we, uh, we made. If you have this role and you have this test, then it would be nice for you to, for us, for you to get back to us with the results to compare, you know, how we thought uh, these roles and these skills levels uh, compared to, to your uh, working field, for instance. Because um, again, it's based on the expertise on the working group, right? And we've, uh, at the max, we've been 10 to 12 people, right? So uh, it's good to get some real life uh, now, feedback loops actually on the usage 
of, of uh, and the idea behind our competency framework. So I'm encouraging you, uh, actually calling you out or call to action to, to get back to us if you have one of these uh, profiles that we defined to see uh, you know uh, if it works and how it works for you. So the first question, if you have your uh, document open, your Excel sheet or your Google Doc uh, for customer centric action, are you taking action to fulfill customers' needs? Uh, this includes having the courage and accepting and leveraging authority to act in innovative ways. So what is your gut feeling? Is this uh, always, never, or uh, you know, uh, in between? Second question, are you taking uh, focused, are you taking action focused on the end result rather than intermediate steps? Understanding that the end of the product, for instance, is the goal rather than the process taken to achieve it. For end-to-end -end responsibility, are you taking action to demonstrate complete responsibility for your product lifecycle from conception to sunset, including its ongoing performance? For cross-functional autonomous teams, are you taking action to understand other people's perspectives and demonstrating the desire and ability to work in teams with diverse profiles from development to operation? For continuous improvement, are you taking action to identify opportunities to streamline work and reduce waste? And for the last one, automate everything you can. Are you taking action to identify areas for potential automations? Next slide, please. It'll get there slowly but surely. Yeah, does it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for DevOps business management, operational business awareness, are you taking action to understand an organization's context and how it's structured? For efficiency, are you taking action to understand and increase the input of, sorry, the output of the organization using the same or fewer resources? For flow, are you taking action to deliver value to customers? For value proposition and optimization, are you taking action to continuously evaluate and move towards the value the company has promised to deliver its customers? Again, this is very, this is a very important one, right? Uh, relationship and contract management. Are you taking action to understand improving and automating contract uh, management while maintaining trust and relationship with your customers, vendors, partners, and employees? In my worker field, this is usually very, very hard. Thinking in relationships uh, instead of, you know, competitive or having contracts that are actually war declarations. Um, program management: taking action to plan, launch, and execute initiatives in complex iterative environments. Uh, measurement: uh, Are you taking action to design meaningful measures aligned to business strategy, collecting data, and interpret it? And correct and valid way and using it for, to drive strategic achievement. And the last one, evolution of agile architecture. Are you taking action to understand, develop and implement solutions that can evolve to meet the changing needs of a system without compromising its integrity? And I just want to switch to a questionnaire, Andrea, uh, by Jalsin. Uh, how can organizations ensure that the DASA DevOps principles adequately address industry-specific requirements and regulatory compliance in the rapidly evolving landscape of DevOps practices. <sighs> okay, that was a mouthful. Um, uh, well, by, you know, looking into what those principles mean for your organization, right? And, and again, uh, every country and probably every business area is quite specific. So what we try to do with the competency framework is provide you with the backbone to structure uh, learnings, uh, cultural uh, need, wants and needs of a company or even a sub team to, to have this as a visual, right? And again, not use it as a stick in uh, performance reviews, but actually use it as an enhancement to both the career path of a person, but also the upskilling and reskilling inside an organization. I agree hundred percent. I think the important piece here is not like this is the end all be all, um, but this, this is the underlying structure. And the question is then how do you apply it? So when we say like take action to deliver value to customers, how do you apply that within your specific context? Right. Yeah. And that, that's all it is. How do you apply that within your industry? How do you apply that giving the constraints that you have? And if you have any issues to determine the, the type of questions or the type of uh, or cultural um, 
implications that it would have for your team, please get back to us as the working group, you know, and then we can we can uh, probably schedule a talk with uh, the brain power of our collective working group and uh, maybe help you on your way. Henk uh, Lederhoff is asking, what target groups is the competency framework intended for? Um, well, the competency framework is, is intended for uh, individuals uh, mostly, but again, like the old competence framework, the spider web, you can leverage it for a skill pathing uh, of your complete team, uh, and it can be used for anything. Uh, can you, you uh, answer the question of Luigi, uh, Andrea? Uh, beyond the scores for each question, how do you include qualitative judgment depending on the organization you are, the maturity of your teams, the stakeholders, middle managers, et cetera? Um, so I, it, depend, it depends on the structure of, of your team, right? This is just a base a base layer. Um, I could probably dive in and ask another 10 questions about every single one of these things. But the question is, does it make sense for you and your team to focus on DevOps business management? Is that an area where you need help achieving your goals at the moment? Um, and then from there, have a conversation about it as a group. I think be very, very open. Um, think about your team in terms of like Legos, right? You're, you have your little Lego house, it needs to fit a certain shape, and that certain shape are the goals and products and outputs that you need. And within there, you need all of the skills and competencies to help you to help you get it. If you figure out that this this chunk of DevOps business management isn't where it should be, we need to have a conversation as a team of how do we fill that fill that in so that our house is whole and stable. And you're free to use the framework to define your own roles, right? And then define what you expect from that role and then measure and use the competition framework to measure uh, performance uh, on that role that you defined. So you can use it that way as well. Sam, did we make it through all of these? I think I... Yes, yes, we did. Know. That's right. Okay. <laughs> but I paused, I, I paused at the end for us, for our convenience, right? Okay. All right, sound, sounds good. Okay, so I'm going to jump into self uh, self regulation. So this is all about your ability to monitor and adjust your thoughts and behaviors to achieve outcomes. Um, so this is one of those core areas that we, we again expect everybody to have. The first is continuous improvement. Take action to improve oneself on an ongoing basis. So how often do you take the opportunity to seek out development? Work autonomy and planning. How often or how often do you take action to uh, work independently and proactively without supervision or permanent instruction? So you, do you need, feel like you need a lot of guidance uh, when you work or do you feel like you are able to create your own structure and move forward? Time management and prioritization. Take action to plan and exercise conscious control of time spent on specific activities to increase efficiency and productivity. How efficient are you in your own your own planning? Self-motivation. Take action to overcome obstacles in pursuit of a long-term long-term goal or in state. So are you able to see the light at the end of the tunnel and work towards it? Coping with uncertainty and change. Take action to implement strategies to deal with emotions that arise in uncertain or changing circumstances. So essentially, do you manage your stressful situations well? Emotional intelligence, take action to perceive, use, understand, and manage emotions. Emotions can be a really powerful thing, right, when used effectively. So do you do, you do that? Do you do that how often? Next up, we have critical thinking. First one here, structured problem solving. So take action to identify problems, define their main elements, examine possible solutions, and act on resolving them, and then re reflect on lessons learned. I think that last part is usually the part that gets forgotten. <laughs> so again, here, I could divide this into probably Every single one of those bullet point items could be its own question or several questions. Um, biases recognition. Take action to recognize and counteract biases, biases in your, your decision making. 
ability to learn, research, and synthesize information. So how often do you take action to collect, organize, and analyze information from various sources to increase understanding of a topic or issue? Agile thinking, take action to continuously, or I'm sorry, take action to consciously, I can read you guys, shift thinking or strategies when the situation requires it. Got some background noise coming in. Everyone make sure they're on mute for us. I don't see who it is. No idea. But, yeah, I'm uh, not sure. It might be me, let me check. Not you, nope. No, okay. 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 Um, Let's, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna mute everybody. Oh, somebody got it. Whew, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So where where was I? I did agile thinking. Um, I think decision making is sense making and complexity. So how often do you take action to structure the unknown so as to be able to act on it and select a course of action among several possible alternatives? So how do you how do you deal with the unknown? Do you feel like you're successful with that? At what frequency? Risk analysis. Take action to identify and assess factors that may jeopardize the success of a project or achieving a goal. Data literacy and data interpretation. So take action to read, understand, create, communicate, and or leverage data during the decision making process. Or do you make a lot of assumptions? Any questions about this uh, group or family of uh, skills? Okay, let's continue. I feel like my, my chat is updating like at a different rate. No, it's, it's going well, I, I keep my eye on it. Thank you, sir. All right, last one here. This one's all about collaboration. Um, the last one in this, this area, right? We have to get the, to the technical capabilities, but collaboration. Um, so starting out with communication, take action to gain a full, please stay on mute. Thank you. Um, all right, sorry. Take action to gain a full understanding of issues from others, adapt your method of transferring that information information to the message or audience. So, you know, typically the way that I would talk to you guys uh, in, well, I, don't, I don't know, you're lots of different roles, lots of different people. But the way I would talk to um, a data engineer about upskilling is going to be very different from the way I'm gonna talk to an L&D professional about upskilling, right? How often are, how are you at, at making those adjustments? Coordination and flow optimization. So uh, take action to manage, coordinate, and evaluate your own activity in relation to that of the team in order to optimize the delivery rather than just your own contribution. So are you looking at the whole when you're looking at what you do? Cooperation and cross-team ways of working. So take action to align activity to meet the objectives or goals of multiple stakeholders, be they customer, team, internal stakeholders, or suppliers. Conflict resolution. Take action to monitor, manage, and resolve conflicts within the group, taking into account the needs of all of its members. Teamwork and dynamics take action to create cohesion in the team in order to obtain common objectives. Inclusiveness and psychological safety. Take action to create an environment that is comforting, trusting, and open, which is one of the key things, right, to creating that environment that supports continuous development and sharing. And social intelligence, take action to recognize and respond to the emotional needs of colleagues. All right, are there any questions related to this one that we need to look at? 
Not necessarily about this one, but a question on how to avoid the reduce risks in DevOps implementation projects. Uh, uh, I think uh, so, so that's uh, yeah, that's a whole new <laughs> webinar. Uh, but yeah, uh, like like the same with with agile, right? It's just start small with one team and and run into the barriers of the organization uh, and and test it from there. Just just start small, uh, please. For your own convenience as well as for the uh the overall um you know success of the uh, of the transformation we have a question for you andrea how do you interpret social intelligence once you receive the answers good question oh you're on mute that probably that would probably yeah, help if no, I wasn't. Yeah, no. um, so social intelligence, recognize and respond to the emotional needs of colleagues. If you if you never do this, chances are everyone excuse the language, everyone thinks you're an asshole, right? <laughs> you're not. <laughs> that that's the re, that's the reality of it. So if if you're the asshole in the team, um, you probably answered never or rarely to this. Uh, if you answered, you know. Uh, always this is someone that we're that we're looking at as probably a honestly a really good leader um this is one of those qualities that really associates with that leadership uh, that leadership area in terms of how are you working with others um and we would expect from from leaders within an organization so depending on you know where it comes across and then and then what what you do with it and who who they are as as they're taking this and what are their goals so if they answered quite you know i do this never or rarely um they're going to need to upskill no matter who they are uh on on this they they need to get a little bit better at reading the emotions of others reading the situation right read, read the room um and being able to respond to that by maybe just doing something as simple as stop talking about a topic that is really touchy for for people in the room like stop stop picking on something that's that's really touchy whereas if you're talking to a, a you know a manager and they answered rarely or sometimes we probably need to go up just a little bit right like just a little just a little step um sometimes that could look like coaching training right again it depends sort of who are they what is what is their job role what are they trying to do and where did they sort of find themselves on that scale so Luigi, yeah. I hope that that answered your question. If not, feel free to ask a follow up. Yeah, and this also takes into account, right, uh, culture or maybe, you know, the workspace you're in, you know, highly regulated environments are less, uh, are, there's less uh, room for creativity, for instance, right? It's just if within one year we have to re uh, we have to report on X. So we have to do it and this, you know, uh, we have to do it through way Y, and that's that's just what expect this is expected of us. I just just think now, also triggered by your uh, question, Luigi, is that especially this one collaboration would be nice to do. You know, if the if the psychological safety is already there a bit, to do it within your team, right? To to for me to actually ask Andrea. Well, you know, I scored myself a three on social intelligence. Uh, do you agree? Uh, and then her answer would be. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. Or maybe, maybe not. I think you could work on that a little bit. Like there was this one time, Sam, where, uh, <laughs> <That's not good. laughs> but, no, but, but the, the point, the point is to do maybe a 180 or a 360 exactly. sort of assessment with this. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, on the Schuyter is, 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 is also pointing in or moving into this, um, direction, right? How can we trust people to, to fill this in, uh, you know, uh, um, truthfully? um yeah it's it's it, well maybe if the uh, if they say that uh, psychological safe environment and they everybody scores at a three but nobody talks about the issues or uh, actually uh, you don't even feel the freedom to confront them on it then that necessarily or that definitely is an indicator that the psychological safety is not good um so, yeah. there was also a little bit of research to suggest that people can overestimate or underestimate their performance in given areas. Um, so there is then other research that like backs that up or, or then like um, look, looks at, so let, let me, let me, let me back up. There was a specifically research that looked at students 
uh, in a class and ask them to assess how they think they would perform on a test. And then after the test, they look at the scores and ask them uh, and compare and compare that. Um, and what they found in that research was that um, people who were the most incompetent tended to overrate themselves and people who were competent tended to underrate themselves. But then a statistician went back uh, here quite recently, I think just a year or two ago, and remodeled this and actually found that this was just a bias of people overrating themselves in general, regardless of competency level. <laughs> nice. Okay, to confuse it, everybody. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so that that being said, anytime you look at this, you could probably look at it and just go down one step for for everyone. Yeah, and you know you're completely free to create your own sub questions for this, right? And your own uh, levels. Um, we provided you with some amazing tools. Is what we think, specifically for for DevOps way of working uh, within organizations. Uh, but yeah, you can you can deep dive this uh, as in a, you know in a in a team setting as well. Like okay, what what do we think is collaboration or what do we think is good communication? Um, yeah, and Carla Bastiansen has, has shared a podcast on creating psychological safety in the workspace. Um, and then we also had a question. So some not or comment actually. Mm -hmm. Uh, some not few of the identified competency in the competency framework are abstract, such as risk uh, management and collaboration. Sure. Mm, How can but they're not. Is... They're not abstract. I, I just want to jump in here. I would say they're <laughs> not actually super abstract. Um, and I'm gonna. I'm not gonna jump into risk management. That like I will say, DevOps is not my area of expertise. But um, for those of you who are curious, my dissertation is actually about uh, collaboration, competency development. So it's not as abstract as as we think. And there are really specific indicators that we can look for to understand uh, if somebody has collaboration as one of their competencies or not. Um, so for example, we can look at how often they're, they're speaking or asking questions in, uh, in a group setting. We can look at, uh, are they sharing information? Um, are they asking clarifying questions of their team members when, when things are, uh, are being shared? Are they immediately shooting down ideas or are they trying to understand what the idea is and how to integrate it in, right? So they're really specific things uh, that we can look for for every single one of these. Yeah, the, the follow-up uh, question, right? So how can we ensure more specific skills at enablement uh, in the DevOps competency framework in order to effectively develop and assess the capabilities of their teams? Well, um, we, we not only define these levels uh, or these um, uh, collaboration for the, the family, right, of collaboration. We also define these uh, subsection uh, questions. Uh, we also define the levels. And the ultimate, ultimate goal, uh, if, you know, for moonshot thinking, right, what, if we had enough uh, money or have unlimited money and unlimited resources, is that we would have the DASA Talent Com uh, Academy ready with all these different levels of all these different um, uh, competencies, right? So for instance, you could go to the DASA Talent Academy, look into communication, and for level one, there's a video or a, or a, a YouTube link or a, a abstract paper that will uh, show you what we think is required for level one and for level two and for level three. Um, we're still working on that. Um, so yeah, that, that that's the best, uh, That's how these products hook into each other and, and all uh, will support you on this, uh, you know, uh, tracking and uh, enabling this uh, learning path and reskilling and upskilling. I think just, uh, yeah. just to be clear, right, there there are some of those, there's a good chunk of those actually that are already prepared. Um, and mm -hmm. you can sort of explore on the website in the Talent Academy yeah. section, yeah. Um, some of the courses that are already available by job role, by skill, by level. Yeah. I, I see Jan has his hand up. Yeah, Jan. Yeah. Yes, uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. I like to elaborate on that because I think it has an advantage to keep it a bit abstract, <clears throat> so you can discuss the results and and translate it into the specific situation and needs of your organization. If you try to make it, uh, let's say, specific uh, as possible, then that good discuss you miss probably miss that good discussion. So I think it it really has an advantage to not make it too specific. Um, 
uh, but but yeah uh, look at the results and discuss with each other what do you mean uh, uh, with that and and why do you score it higher I, I think it, uh, it it really is an advantage uh, to, uh, to to keep the bit abstract no. yeah absolutely and so but within the within the framework sometimes it helps to have those examples so that you know like oh, does this actually apply to my organization but otherwise i agree there is a power that sits behind it being a little broader a little higher higher level and then you can choose of those what you what you apply that's a good point Jan. okay so we'll go to the next one yeah leadership sam back to you yay leadership uh don't see it yet so it's a oh here we go okay for vision and inspiration. As a leader or uh, a part of a team where you're an expert uh, in, the, in a certain area, right? Um, are you taking action? Are you being a visionary or in, are you inspiring uh, people? Are you taking action to co-create the future to get buy-in from those involved in order to create change? On the field of accountability, are you taking action to open yourself up for inspection on your actions, practices, and policies by those whom they affect? And the coach empower and motivate others one, are you taking action to unlock potential with individuals and teams? And with role modeling and influencing each other, are you taking action to embody DevOps values uh, and ex uh, ethics and expectations as a tool to affect the action, decisions, and opinions of others to get buy-in? Um, so again, uh, this is not just a manager or a CIO or whatever uh, role we have in the organization. Uh, this is for everybody that that aspires to be a leader in in, in the group or uh, in their team. And also, you know, what do we expect somebody to do that? Um, we have a question about uh, the self overrating one and the assessment. Um, they do assessment in pairs. Uh, so you always have an opinion of somebody else of your performance, right? And that's what, in Holland, we have the 360 uh, reviews, right? So it comes back to you. Um, and sometimes it's anonymous, but usually it's within a team, right? So, uh, and there's text uh, fields as well. So if somebody fills in the text field, you can probably relate it back to a certain person. So keep that in mind, right? It's not entirely uh, anonymous. Um, but yeah, I, I will. I will say here, like looking at some of the questions and concerns we see coming in, um, a lot of these are actually addressed to Sam in the the guide for organizations that you talked about a little bit a little bit earlier. Um, mm -hmm. So a lot of you might find benefit in in checking that out. Yeah, we provide it for free, right? So just uh, register. I think I think you have to register for it. But yeah, it's, this this is is very uh, yeah. You don't have to start nowhere we did a lot of groundwork already for you if you if this is a an area that you're interested in um so yeah look at that um let's see uh yeah okay how how about asking teams individuals to rate these qualities of their leaders to compare with the self assessment self of the leader, leaders themselves yeah that's what we have uh, in holland it's called the 360 review right so the team reviews the uh, uh the performance of the leader or the manager or whatever role. So that's very interesting. Okay, we're going to technical capabilities part one. For security, um, are you taking action to plan and carry out security measures to monitor and protect data and systems? For coding and scripting, are you taking action to assess users' needs and specifications and then designing applications, code testing, uh, code testing tests, sorry, and debugging them? Uh, for cloud architecture, are you taking action to develop cloud adoption strategies and plans, application designs and deployment mechanisms? For continuous testing, are you taking action to define necessary tests, uh, implementing and automating and optimizing them? For continuous integration, are you taking action to design systems in order to automate the assemb assembling process for code and building from the various tasks required to prepare new software versions? Uh, for uh, continuous delivery. Are you taking action to get changes of all types, new features, configuration changes, bug fixes and experiments into a testing, staging or production environment for continuous deployment? Are you taking actions to get changes of all types, new features, configuration changes, bug fixes and experiments into the hands of the customer as quickly, sustainably and safe, safely as possible? 
Um, Robert says maybe it's generally more valuable to assess capabilities of complete teams. Um, sure, we totally agree with that. Um, and it's the same way that I talked about the spider web in the beginning, right? You can plot or you can map the assessment of an individual and a team to the skill sets uh, of the complete team, right? And if you want to use it that way, then um, be our guest. Uh, and if it uh, let's, yeah, we're hoping that helps you. It's the, the Lego house, right? That I was talking Let about a little house. bit. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Assess as a team and then dive into individuals to get a closer look at, at where they are in a given area. Yeah, for sure. And you know, even uh, in through value streams, you can do this exercise, right? Okay, what, what are the teams that are in my pipeline? Or what are the teams that are in front of my value stream? What are the teams that are actually dependent on my uh, the value that I create and try to create, right? So it would be nice to do it for a value stream as well. Okay, next one. I would assume this is technical capabilities part two. But yeah, okay, nice. Uh, infrastructure organization, uh, orchestration. Are you taking action to automate the provisioning and configuration of the infrastructure services needed to support an app moving throughout all the stages? For continuous monitoring, are you taking actions to incorporate and uh, monitoring, sorry, and observ observability is always a difficult word, across each phase of the IT development operations life cycles? Reliability engineering, are you taking action to create ultra scalable and highly uh, reliable software systems by actively managing and mitigating reliability risks that could adversely affect, affect operations. Are you taking action, uh, sorry, supporting troubleshooting? Are you taking action to connect with customers to understand, diagnose and repair technical and or functional issues or provide support for optimal usage of the services? For front-end development, are you taking actions to develop the graphic useful uh, user interface of a product leveraging relevant technologies. For AI and ML, or MLL even right now, are you taking action to research, build, and design self-running AI systems to automate predictive models? And for tech translation and enablement, are you taking actions to simplify and explain complex uh, technical topics to non-technical profiles to enable them to understand, assess, manage, and or use a product or service? And that's, I think that's one of the most important things that we still can't do, right? As IT, we all, I think we all know that picture of the uh, the customer that asked for a, for a swing on a tree and we end up with a, an amusement park with the corresponding bill for it, right? Uh, and just when people ask me what I do, it's just 80% of the work I do is just having people that are usually colleagues talk to each other and clear and, and, and uh, you know, clear language, right? So it's, yeah, this one is a very important one. I think I just, I want to point out here as well as we, as we look at these, right? Like within each of these inside of the, the, the framework and in that extended report, we also have like, what are the technologies that sit behind this? What are the theories or methodologies that sit behind this, right? Like we can't, we can't necessarily capture everything in one single little question. So just just remember, we've, we've taken that into account and we're trying to keep it short for today. Um, there was a, com a question, tech translation. One common ask is, can you explain me to me in plain English what you were saying? I'm usually the person asking that question of like Sam and Bart and. <laughs> yeah, well, it's shout out for Bart Schipper who is also, uh, you know, in the chat and uh, also a team, uh, team member of our working group. So uh, yeah, he's one of the uh, brilliant minds that we work together with. And I see Lucas' uh, camera coming on. He's, he's one of the other working groups. Uh, that's our colleagues here. There's Bart. Hey, Bart. Uh, so yeah, the, it's just tremendously uh, worthwhile and, and fun and, and challenging as well to work with these people, right? Because I know absolutely zero or even below zero about learning and de uh, development strategies and, and all the stuff that Andrea says she's doing and I still I don't even understand the job titles sometimes so yeah it's it's tremendously cool to learn from all these different uh, you know skill sets and uh, that we yeah just got combined as a working group to work on this and to actually actually deliver this product it's, it's just yeah exciting times I also saw some people in here from the talent academy who deserve yeah, a yeah, shout for sure. out for for, sure. for their yeah. for their work yeah Shout out to you guys. 
Okay. Uh, and Marcel as well. Yeah, Marcel is also in the chat. Marcel for uh, was always there to enable us to do our work, uh, like our uh, so, sort of our mother hen. Uh, it's very nice. Our herder, our cat herder. <laughs> okay, next slide, I All guess. Right. Yeah, I think it's time to go over to the results tab, everyone. At the bottom, the bottom of your sheet, yeah. you should see one that says uh, one that says results. There will be a line associated with each of the competencies um, where you assessed yourself, and then a one that's sort of a block that's associated with all of them. Um, hopefully, <laughs> that kind of gives an, an overview of where you are within that block. That would look a little bit like this output. So, Sam, I'll let you talk about talk about this. <laughs> Marsha asked, what's his nickname? Well, it's more your product, Cat Herder, right? Because we're all going in different directions, but you're trying to manage us, Cat Herder. Okay. Uh, one thing from Robert still. Um, in our organization, we have associated the capabilities to explain complexity and share knowledge, uh, knowledge to engineering seniority levels. I find this quite refreshing as informer times, speaking in riddles for the site of seniority. <laughs> Dear Lord, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, that's, uh, yeah, the, the, the more intricate and technical you speak, uh, the better you are, I guess. Uh, but that's but it, funny. But it goes Robert. back to the point that kind of understanding what other people are doing makes it a little bit more <laughs> easier to communicate. So speaking in riddles um, doesn't mean quite as much. Yeah, yeah, well, luckily you're in a position to understand this, right? And then also maybe finally in IT, we start really to work together and listening to each other and then, you know, understanding each other, you know, we can dream big, right? Okay, so in the overall picture, we have the test automation engineer and we see these levels uh, based on uh, level one, two, and three. We see that, uh, you know, the, the DevOps business management requirements are a little bit lower than all the other ones. Uh, critical thinking for instance is, is very important. Uh, why, how do I build my test or basically start with? What are we trying to test? How I'm how am I building my tests? Uh, how I, can I you know translate my te technical expertise as a tester or a test automation engineer to to the rest of the team? And how how well am I you know helping them understand my field of work if we're looking at these uh, cross uh, functional autonomous teams, right? Okay. So next I'm slide. Curious, how, how many people ended up being a, a good test automation engineer? <laughs> I don't know. If you know somebody in one, uh, then we can probably hire them. Uh, <laughs> we should clone them, right? Okay. So the way you know we talked about this. So if 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 it's a couple of approaches, right? If you are a test automation engineer and you're trying to to determine where you're at skill level wise, uh, you can use this uh, test to see uh, how you score on our perceived uh, levels. Uh, if you are Looking into getting uh, into the field of test automation engineer, for instance, you can see what skills we think you require to do it. So, um, or uh, also, you know, if you're, uh, uh, you know, a team manager and you need to hire a test automation engineer all of a sudden, because uh, first uh, you did everything by hand, then this is a nice, uh, you know, checklist maybe to see if the person you're trying to hire has the skills that uh, that your team requires. But uh, that's not the only thing, you know, uh, it's very important to have these peer discussions, you know, uh, to leave uh, a little bit of room for uh, continuous uh, improvement for the individuals and the teams, you know, to, to look at up and reskilling, to visit some events. I went to a DevOps Enterprise Summit and I can tell you um, my head is still buzzing to the fact that, to the point that it's, uh, it's still overloaded with all the information I got there and uh, the people I met. It's, if I could picture my head exploded, it, it still feels like that weeks, two, three weeks after that. Um, but that's not the only way you learn, of course, you know, you can look past your own team, uh, you know, uh, and do something that I, I refer to as, uh, you know, um, now, let's get into that later. But yeah, look at, uh, you know, if you were in a value stream, it would be nice if you know what your, the front part of your value stream, what the feeding part of your value stream is doing and understand the value they're trying to achieve for you to be a better team or a better person, you know, or yeah, not a better person per se, but a better uh, employee in the company. Um, you know, you can look into certification. Um, we also tried to map different levels of the old competency framework or uh, spiderweb thing to 
different levels of uh, other certification schemes, right? For instance, for uh, infrastructure automation, uh, level three would be, or level two would be uh, Azure Fundamentals, for instance, right? And level three would be, uh, um, I don't know what, a solution expert, and level four would be architect, right? So that's something that uh, in the end, with our mutual thinking, hopefully we can also provide that as a service, but that's also something that your center of expertise for learning can do as well. And again, that's something that I uh, did at a, at a company that I work for, just map all the different certifications that are relevant to uh, either this skill framework uh, or the levels of the scale framework or uh, the levels of skill that you require within a team. Like we mentioned before, we have the DASA Talent Academy and a lot of these uh, levels of learnings are already done and recorded. Um, and even if you want to uh, contribute to that as well, uh, we would like to uh, you know, do a call to action. Uh, if you consider yourself an expert and maybe some one other person also thinks that, then you know you can uh, you're asked to uh, you know contribute to the uh, Talent Academy. Uh, like I said, and uh, yeah, it's the way I met Andrea. It's these working groups and working together with DASA really just yeah, gives you uh, that uh, community feeling, right? It really feels like uh, I found my tribe here uh, as well as the same with the event that I visited. You want to add something there, Andrea? You're on mute. Yeah, I will say that Sam went to that event and then like since then he has been spamming me with new articles and uh, screenshots of slides. So it just and I've, I've been learning some really interesting thing about uh, about how talent development is applied specifically within a DevOps context from all of this. So it just goes to show how involvement in an organization like DASA, having those peer discussions, having some of that boundary crossing can be can be fun because now I can make fun of Sam for spamming me with his brain explosions and <laughs> And I get to learn something new too. True. Yeah, my uh, previous nickname when I was still actively gaming was Damn Sam the Spam from Amsterdam. So yeah, that that figures with the amount of text messages I put through uh, Warcraft raids and uh, League of Legends uh, games and everything, right? So yeah, I, I chat a lot. So yeah, it, it, it's how I basically uh, it's how I learn typing <laughs> just by chatting. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next slide. All right. All right. So this, this is kind of kind of back to me. So hopefully now you guys have all had sort of a chance to look through um, your your competency assessment. And you know, you might have been thinking of it like as a team. Does your team do all of these things? You might have been thinking at it about it from your individual perspective for your own job role, right? Whatever um, whatever that might be. Hopefully you've had a chance to sort of look at it and and take it in um, and maybe you've even started to think of some ideas right like the map that we were just looking at mm -hmm. but then we have to put some we have to put something in place right and that can look like any of those things it can look like all of those things uh, as much as it makes sense but then what happens after that right going through transformation is is difficult um, maintaining progress and continuous improvement takes effort and as with any sort of DevOps project, we need to be thinking about measuring the success of any upscaling programs that we are putting into place. So let's say you take this assessment, your team takes these assessments, you work together to put it in place, uh, put in place an upscaling program based on the identified gaps. The question is always, did it work? Did it help? Now, I'm gonna talk about this from a, a business uh, a business context rather than an individual con uh, in an individual context, um, but that's something we can certainly uh, address in, in uh, Q&A afterwards. Um, but in a business context, we're not training and upskilling for, just for the sake of it, right? We're trying to achieve something. Um, it can be affective, like a sense of achievement. That's more of an individual level item. Um, I love learning, but in a business context, we don't do it just for fun, right? The goal is to achieve business objectives faster and more reliably. The goal is to maybe increase overall efficiency and productivity of the team. Um, when individuals are trained in the necessary skills and best practices, they can work more effectively within a DevOps environment, resulting in faster delivery of products and services, um, help reduce the risk of errors and downtime. Uh, it can improve employee retention and job satisfaction. And usually, usually when I say things like this, people are like, "That's awesome, Andrea," but how do I do? How do I do that? Um, so with that, I wanna I wanna just pop up another quick poll. 
Uh, I don't know. Let's see. So pull here, publish. So are you currently measuring the impact of your upskilling efforts? Give everyone a second to let those votes, votes roll in. Are you trying to understand if it could be your personal upskilling efforts, like you learn something, or are you trying to look for the impact of that later? It could be your business, uh, your business um, analysis, whatever that might look like. All right, so we're starting to get them in slowly. And this, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be honest, this was a, <laughs> this was just about what I expected, because it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to think about. Um, I have. 24% saying yes, we are. I have 72% saying no, we are not. And I have 3% saying uh, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. All right, and that's that's still still changing and adjusting a little bit. Um, and I, I'm curious though, if, if you guys have any context uh, about this, drop in the chat, why? Why aren't you measuring it? Or why are you measuring it? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Is your chat refreshing? I'm not seeing anything. Sometimes uh, I'll, really just, I'll just chat it through fast. And... Why are you measuring it or why aren't you measuring it? I measure myself to ensure that I keep going. Yeah. Sometimes having data about like when I go when I go like exercise, you guys I hate exercising. I've got to be really honest with you right now. But having like the data on my smartphone for you know you ran this far today um, versus yesterday, or you ran this fast versus yesterday, that can be something that's that's really motivational. For sure, for sure. Uh, uh, yeah, it's good to hear, uh, Larry. Yeah. For instance, now we all have these uh, body measurement uh, devices, right? You can use your phone for it. You can use your smartwatch for it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's the same with your upskilling, right? Um, uh, there are some things like, for instance, there are some books that I really, really, really need to read <laughs> still, but they're on the pile. So now, uh, yeah, I really have to focus my 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 books and what is what is exactly the thing that I'm trying to achieve, and what are the topics related to that. Uh, yeah, that, that's where you can, you know, really focus and then, you know, it, it, you can actually measure it. How many books have I read that I wanted to read last month, right? Something like that. <laughs> Bart says he's not measuring impact of upskilling because he's exhausted about doing the upskilling. Oh, that's true. If, if we're talking about, you know, uh, like fitness uh, or exercising, that, that's the way it works, right? You, you're, you're already tired by doing the exercise and, uh, yeah. You also need some time for relaxation, right? So that that's even that you can even measure that. Are we even giving the, the teams a little bit of uh, breathing space to actually absorb it and you know to to uh, to categorize to shape the information that you learned? Uh, like for me, for instance, because I was still busy with my family. Two weeks later, after the event, my head is still exploding. I'm still not really there, ordering and and you know if, if configuring and you know analyzing all the data that I uh, that I learned. It's just still a jumble a little bit. So hopefully, uh, with the school vacation coming up, uh, kids are going to uh, stay at home, and then I can go to work and start to process all the stuff. Let's hope for that. I I do think that you know one of the things that we have to be careful of um, is over over assessing, right? Yeah, also, over assessing yeah. people, over like over encouraging people to do things when they're already doing things. Um, it can be it can be a little a little bit problematic sometimes. Um, yeah. now, now I'm starting to see more time. Okay, um, and it's rewarding to see the data and progress of your achievements. Measuring is very hard. Ultimately, the only KPIs are business outcomes. Um, but that's that's really that's really important, right? That's actually the part that most organizations struggle with is those business KPIs and outcomes. We tend to focus on things like, did did we finish it, right? Did people go to it? Did they like it? That kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna get into the how now, right? And it comes down to six six things for me. So first, you're going to before you do any of this, before you assess, before you try to do anything you're going to choose, you're going to look at like, what is it that my business is trying to achieve? What are the KPIs that are associated to that within my team? 
And then we're going to establish a baseline, right? What is the team achieving at right now? Or if it's a new team that you're establishing, at least set a goal for how that team should be performing associated to those specific uh, to those specific KPIs. And this, this again, somebody said like they're only associated here, but this is almost where they are never associated. I have to be real. I have so many conversations with um, learning and training professionals across tons of different use cases, and most are not are not getting to this point. They're they're really thinking about um, did they did they finish it or uh, what's my completion look like. But what's important is establishing those KPIs first and foremost. Then you want to actually do the implementation of whatever your strategy is and train to the key areas that will impact those KPIs. Then we're going to evaluate it, right? Did we see the behavior changes that your program was actually designed to initiate? Because if your behaviors don't change, your KPI shouldn't change. Um, if they do, then it could be linked to something else entirely, which is important to be able to pinpoint, be it good, uh, be it good or bad. So for example, um, maybe you put in place a, you, you figured out like, okay, I want to uh, improve the resolution rate of tickets coming into my team. You put in place a training that's designed to maybe improve their technical capacity, their troubleshooting capacity, right, whatever that is. And then um, you go back and you you look at the data and it, it's, it says either nothing changed or they're not doing the things that they were meant they were meant to be doing. And now we need to look a little bit closer. Maybe it actually turns out there's something in the ticketing process that is a problem, right? And that's why the KPI changed or didn't change. So we have to be thinking about those things too. Um, and then if you didn't see the changes, but you did see the behavior changes, we need to go back and revamp the training or do some sort of remedial work, right? Some, um, again, that process analysis until we do see those behaviors change. And once we see that being put in place, we wait a little bit and we look at those KPIs and we rinse, we rinse and repeat. Um, the KPIs you choose are important because they'll direct the training interventions that you're targeting and you want to improve. So for example, if you want to improve lead time for changes, um, you may want to look at different skills than if you're trying to improve release stability. And I'm gonna show you guys a real, a real example. This is one from um, the organization that I work with today. So, uh, and it is in the uh, sales and revenue department. So, so bear with me, um, but the goal is for you to sort of see that process in play. So these are the stats for an onboarding program for a sales team. So the first thing we did is we figured out what are the KPIs we wanted to improve by changing an onboarding program. We chose what I call leading metrics, right? Those, those sort of soft ones that we tend to see when we're looking at these programs, like did they finish it? Did they like it? These are the things that I can see right away. And then I also chose some performance KPIs, like how often are they winning deals? Are they able to generate their own deals? Um, and it usually takes about three to six months to see the impact on some of this data because of the nature of the role, the business, the KPIs that were chosen. And then we looked at the, the baseline. Where are those KPIs today with the previous onboarding cohorts before this new structure is, is in place? And then we took that and we set a goal to go to the to, to go up a step, right? So on, on here you can see which are the leading metrics, which are the performance KPIs, what the baseline is, and what that what the goal is. So then we redesigned the program. We shortened it and we built in things like on the job learning, experiential exercises, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, and then we ran it, right? After that, we assessed the behaviors of our new sellers. Um, we, we looked for the behaviors associated with the, the skills that we were trying to develop, um, things like conducting a discovery uh, or building relationships when they're talking to prospects. Like, so did those behaviors change? Did we see them implementing the techniques that we were looking for? And then we reassessed it. From there, we made some changes, right? Like what worked, what, what didn't work? Where do we need to make changes? And then we, then we actually made the change and we ran it with another cohort, a new cohort of, of sales professionals. Um, now, as you can see in this second cohort, there are still some areas to improve to meet all of those goals, but that's where continuous improvement comes into 
any learning and upskilling initiative that we put in place. As, as much as I enjoy it, I don't build these programs for fun. I build them to help individuals and teams achieve their goals so that the organization is hitting its goals in turn. And the ability to show this piece and say, you know, we help generate an additional $2.5 million in revenue by improving these stats through our upskilling initiatives is it's really where this kind of effort is, is going. And usually it's dollars that talk when we're trying to figure out, you know, can we invest in this upskilling initiative? And that's why those KPIs are so important. All of this equates to about 2.5 million uh, in revenue from these two cohorts that went through. So, you know, you know. Uh, uh, you, yourself, yourself. Whew, okay, that was. Working from home and fun, yay. It was such a shock, you guys. Okay. <laughs> um, um, Jan is saying that he's the only one seeing the uh, slide we charge. I can see the slide, but it's uh, it's is anybody else seeing this, having this? I don't think so. Can I can I share uh, my screen just for a second, Andrea? Because yeah, you show sure. this onboarding program for this for the for this KPIs, right? Uh, I just ran across this or came across this, um, and uh, I think it's very interesting. Uh, as, so maybe just as with... you pull it up, I'll I'll wrap up a little bit. I'll wrap up a little bit here. Okay, um, but so, so as how, so what does this mean for you, right? As team members, as managers, um, as leaders, right? There are different things that you could be doing to improve the impact of upskilling initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. As a team member actively seeking out opportunities and pushing for them, um, talking to your team, talking to your leaders about it, and following through as well, um, doing things like sharing what you know with your colleagues openly. Um, as managers, you know, uh, frontline people leaders, right, working with your team to create a psychologically safe space for sharing and learning, um, working with your team to identify key areas of growth, and then also working with your leaders and your learning uh, and development teams to identify, you know, what are the key, key KPIs that I'm trying to impact on my team, and then partnering with them on building or, or leveraging existing programs like the, the DASA Talent Academy to drive towards those goals. And then as leaders, right, clearly communicating what are these performance metrics, these KPIs, and then driving in, uh, driving buy-in up and down the hierarchy to ensure the success of, of these programs. Um, very, very often when it comes to these kinds of programs, success actually starts with leadership. In fact, most of the things are owned by leadership, not by, not by individuals, not by, not by um, the talent team. They are owned by leadership. So just to sort of wrap it all up in a nice, neat little bow here, um, the competency framework is a great tool to help you have some of these conversations, right? Identify your key KPIs, identify the skills that have gaps that would be impactful to improve uh, on those KPIs. The DASA Talent Academy can help you sort of build and be a key part of that upskilling strategy. Um, and then you need to figure out if you took the right approach, for your goals and your team by looking at the impact. So what you saw today will sort of help you pinpoint in association with your business drivers and your business KPIs that you identify. Um, it, it'll help you sort of pinpoint and, and work on those things. But ultimately, you have to own and drive your transformation um, to make it a success, whether that be your individual transformation or your organization's digital transformation. Sorry, Sam, I needed to, I needed to get that. No, no, yeah, sure. Sorry for yeah. interrupting, Andrea. That was a bit uh, rude, I guess. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share this, right, for as an example of the whole story that, that you just said, uh, that you just uh, showed us, or shared with us, sorry. Uh, if you look at, for instance, this is something new I just came across. Uh, we, uh, I just came across with two, whatever, um, come across. Um, for instance, if you look at DevX metrics, so what is DevOps, DevX, sorry, DevX is dev, uh, developer experience, right? So actually looking at three uh, three of these uh, pillars, so like feedback loops, cognitive load, and flow state, how can we enable developers to have a, a good environment to work in? Um, if you look at this, right, for, uh, for KPIs, for instance, overall perceived ease of delivering software, employee engagement or satisfaction, uh, like, like actual employee NPS scores, right? Incorporating them in, in KPIs. So if you look at this 
perspective, you can also use our uh, competency framework to, to measure stuff like this, or you can add stuff like this to it. Um, uh, I don't know if there's any copyright, whatever infringements here, but you can uh, you can leverage this as well for your uh, for your individual experience, right? This is specifically for developer experiences, uh, but uh, you will probably have some sort of uh, expectations of your test automation engineers or your uh, scrum master. Uh, scrum master or PO, yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, so yeah. Um, you will probably have some expectations of uh, whatever role you have within your organization or your team, and you can map and, and use and abuse our uh, competency framework for that as well. Uh, and I think that's one of the final slides, Andrea. How are we on slides? We yeah, I, so I think I think we just have sort of one more here before we get into to Q and A. So I'll just pop cool. this back up. But there was before we do that, there was um, a question in the chat actually. So what I'll how about I do this? I will launch the poll, um, and then we can we can wrap up uh, together. Cool. All right, so I'm gonna publish publish that poll. Um, so one last question: uh, If there's anything that you heard or saw today that might have piqued your curiosity, and you'd like to learn more about the competency framework, the community, or talent academy, you're interested in participating, um, let us know. Respond definitely to the poll. Um, that we're launching, that we've just launched, and we'll reach out to follow up with you about it. So I'll let I'll let that run, and then we can get into the questions because there were a couple of questions that came in. The first was, can you share the link to the article that you were just showing that was really tiny? Uh, sorry, Thank sorry. Uh, yeah, it's just shared. And this is something new that um, that just popped up somewhere uh, in in some sort of CTO talk that that was in uh, last week. How how great would it be you know if we just really think from the employees perspective right and like i said uh, twice now already don't use uh, like skill pathing as a requirement or a, a you know as a stick to to beat people with in their job uh, job uh, performance reviews or something right please just enable your teams uh, as well as your leaders right to to be the best they can be and if you have things like that that can map, map a sort of clear path uh, towards what we're actually expecting from people. How great would it be to have actually have a goal to work towards, right? And to have a clear goal. And, you know, even in the best scenario, maybe even know what, what our contribution is to the overall goals, mission and vision of a company. If we can make that happen, you know, by, by maybe using this tool or using a bunch of tools, uh, but yeah. It's great to have this clarity of the path, at least, right? Have something to strive for. Yeah, cognitive load, for instance, you know, it's it's a it's a big part. Maybe we're expecting too much of a team, right? Uh, one of my things that I always focus on is, you know, uh, in agile teams, what I see usually is that we expect in a sprint we expect like a hundred percent work done. Uh, we sometimes even struggle to get that done. Uh, there's no uh, room for maybe incidents or high priority things or maybe PO reprioritizing stuff uh, within a sprint. And I know it's not allowed in Agile, according to the mantra, right? But it would be nice if we have some spare time uh, to do these incidents or these high priority things coming in. Um, and as well, you know, we're not saying put pressure on the team and individuals to reskill and have them force them to do this because it's important for our company, right? But, uh, but give it as an, as an option and uh, as an enablement service to, to create a clear path and expectations. Very rarely do I find an organization someone who is just like, no, I absolutely do not want to learn, <laughs> learn and grow. Especially, yeah, true. It happens, but like most, most people do want that and they're looking for it actively, which is, is actually one of the major reasons that a lot of people are leaving organizations today. They don't see that they have those opportunities. So creating mm -hmm. that space within your team without over assessing and um, creating, creating a lot of extra for them is important. Um, doing things like building it into into the expectations. I saw someone earlier say like, time is a problem. I don't have time to learn. No. Well, that that's actually a problem with team culture then that True. needs to be worked on. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but you don't uh, experience that, but I experience people, uh, let's say network engineers that are severely uh, 
trained in Cisco things, in Cisco environments, right? And now uh, they're also somewhat forced by the organization to uh, to look into the virtual layer on top of the physical layer, right? So some expectation it might be from the company to you know do some uh, I don't know Python scripting on top of the uh, physical layer, right? Uh, and I actually experienced some people that are just saying that no, I don't want to do this uh, because I'm I'm skilled in, in Cisco. This is where I feel comfortable at. So this is also difficult, right? It's it's mean it, it, it's where do we provide so much psychological safety that we can have this person in the company just saying okay, I just want to do this. And how much does that fit into mindset and this FUCA world that we're in, right? Uh, unex uh, uh, uncertain world uh, that we have to be adaptable. I, I think that if you force these people to upskill and reskill, that you're losing them. And it could be a good thing for the company. It could be a good thing for the person. But yeah, it's it's something I see, and it's 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 a bit sad, a bit, I guess. Do we have any more questions on this topic? There was one that popped into to the chat. Um, okay. How oh, about sorry. keeping people at 80% occupancy as a way yeah. to avoid bottlenecks and constraints yeah. and being able to react to unknown circumstances? Oh, yes, for sure. That's, this is one of my mantras, right? It's 70, 20, 10%. Like, and then it depends on maturity of the team, right? Only focus or only um, uh, uh, say that you will uh, d deliver 70% of the value to the PO. So you leave 20% for incidents and high priority stuff. It all depends on the maturity of the PO, right? If he runs into your uh, team room uh, all the time saying, yeah, I have a new shift in priority, then yeah, might might be more than 20%. Uh, but yeah, so 70% creating value for the for within the sprint, 20%, you know, incident uh, priority lanes or whatever you want to call it, and 10% continuous improvement. And 10% continuous improvement can be a wide range of stuff. Right, I have no time to read books, uh, and I and I read, I don't read that fast. Uh, it's it's uh, the stack of books is already bothering me already, but we have maybe one person in the team that really likes to read and likes to read fast. So, give him a percentage of the time instead of working, have him read the book and do a presentation of 15 minutes. Like these are the key points of this book. This is something we can use, uh, and if you want to know more about it, then we can use we can. I found this in this YouTube video, for instance, right? This this would allow uh, you know less cognitive load, hopefully, and share the responsibility of the reskilling of everybody uh, within the team, right? And just use there's always probably one book reader in the in the team already, so so use that person. Yeah, teachbacks are actually really powerful, powerful yeah, for, sure. for, for learning. It's it's funny actually that you say 70 20 10 for the way you organize your work because we actually have a 70 20 10 in uh, how we design learning and upskilling programs as well. Oh, with 70% being focused on um, on the job learning and hands on experiential learning and 20% being focused on networking and peer peer to peer learning a little bit like like we're we're doing here and then 10% being focused on what we normally think about learning right formal learning sitting in a classroom listening to someone lecture you uh, only 10% of of your time learning should be that right and that's something that i that i really want to get into right um I just launched the idea. I, I think I, I Googled it and there's some uh, references to it, but gamification as a service, right? Is you come to me with a, with a business issue, right? And then uh, me and a bunch of colleagues or trainers, we will buy, we will build uh, like a, a context, contextual uh, experience by learning experience that hopefully will, you know, internalize the learning process way better than just, okay, here's a book, or I just stand uh, in front of a screen, uh, you know, pointing at slides. Uh, that's something that that we can see, that's, that I see actually in the development. There's a lot of games out there, like serious uh, games or business simulations, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the best example we have is, is DevOps uh, uh, related is Phoenix Project, right? Um, there's a gamification of that that's used worldwide to explain uh, DevOps. So yeah, that's some of the things that can can enhance your learning, right? And you know, what better what better way to learn something than than just playing some fun games, or you know, maybe even learn something from it with your team, right? Um, I haven't seen any new. Oh no, uh, what do you think are good incentives for people to actually upskill? That's a good question, Sam. I'm interested in your take on this one. 
What have Maybe you learned? Paying your bills is a good incentive. <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, is that supposed to be a stick, Sam? Not a stick. <laughs> no, yeah, but yeah. So a good in incentives uh, are, you know, uh, like. Uh, maybe even also do a gamification board right uh people that read the most books or people that talk to the most colleagues or you know um um you know if if somebody's really really motivated to to learn about something give them that moment that spotlight moment and give them a soapbox moment to just stand on a soapbox physically right on, a little bit on top of the other people like uh, a little bit higher than the other people and just tell them about their experience or you know like we're doing right now we're having our soapbox moments right now um yeah enable them to feel the safety to just share their uh, their uh, expertise right and especially for the people that are introverted right if if you can get an introverted person talking about the stuff they really are into and you enable that in the environment and they 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 step off that soapbox and you know it might not be good the first time but you know at least enable them to experience that uh yeah that that's that's i i, I love that I, I had that one company where we did that and you know even the introverted extremely introverted person said you know thank you for giving me this opportunity to just try in a safe environment and to learn and everything um yeah it's, it's just see what people are people are interested in and and try to enable that 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 little spark to come out and maybe just blast you like a sun solar flare right i'm gonna i'm gonna share something here really quickly um on the screen around that idea of in, engagement because it does sound like it's something that um is is of interest so this is not something that is in the initial presentation this is an engage engagement framework that i've that i've used um the first the first thing is alignment right we to engage, get people engaged we have to make sure it's aligned with our business objectives with their objectives leadership is bought in um we've involved management right you guys are, are really really important like leaders and managers are really important to this we want to build awareness there's things like notifications and visibility get people talking about it um, and then we want to generate activity around it that could be through assigned learning but that's that's only like one way right we also want to make sure we're thinking about channels and communities um, doing things like those learn-a-thons or curate a thon so Sam your idea of having someone read a book and then stand on a soapbox and do a teach back um, that's one of those things um, you could also do a skill of the month. This is actually something that I do in my organization to create sort of a habit. Every month we focus on a new topic uh, for, for our audiences. And then in terms of that reward and recognition, right, this is just one, this is one piece, but a very important piece of how we're thinking about um, incentivizing. So this could be through something like leaderboards and gamification, um, through badges, but ultimately it comes down to things like social recognition, monetary and reward recognition, um, that that those are the sorts of things that we want to be that we want to be thinking about there. But it's just one, it's one part of the the whole. And then we also want to be thinking about reinforcing it. So, you know, is what we're doing tied to our corporate initiatives? Um, is what we're doing tied to uh, tied to what we're doing in our in our team in a meaningful way are leaders continuously involved um, and this is just a short list of some of the things that you could be thinking about there are tons of things that you could be thinking about in each of these categories but if you think about these as you think about rolling out your upscaling initiative it can be it can be extra powerful i'm gonna stop presenting do you have nice. any other questions thank you thank in? you for that addition andrea that was nice good I try hard. This was not scripted, people. <laughs> okay, uh, it's 10, 10 more minutes. Uh, okay, uh, your feedback is valuable to us. Uh, yeah, so Irma uh, enables us to do this uh, presentation and uh, one of the uh, very important behind the scenes staff, right? So uh, can you please leave uh, feedback for us as well, right? Uh, so we can improve our future events. Uh, and it would be nice if you take a few moments to uh, give us this feedback because, you know, uh, we are working in a DevOps kind of way. So feedback loops are very much appreciated and uh, as soon as possible would be nice as well. Um, yeah, I think I think it's what do you want to do? And right, we don't have any more questions. Uh, I think it would be nice for people to just do a bio take break. break. And get some yeah. yeah. And prepare for the rest of the day. 
Uh, there's an awesome program uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, yeah, think, uh, thanks again, all these people uh, just uh, spending time to listen to us and hopefully we helped you. Again, if you need some help or need some documents or something's not working, or, or you might even, you know, um, uh, have some questions or, or even, you know, want to use this in, a, in, a, in a, actually inside your company, you need our help to implement it or to use it, please get back to us. Uh, we're excited to help you. So uh, let us know. Okay. Awesome. Mute myself. I don't know where I am. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much for your interaction in in the chat. Um, it's been really interesting. I loved the sharing of uh, the articles and things. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to check some of those out later. Uh, otherwise, I hope you have a, a wonderful rest of the event, you guys. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Good day. It was really interesting. Well done. Thanks, Andrew. Thank Thanks, you. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. See you later, Thank people. You. Have a good one. Thanks a lot for your for, for your job. You did a good job. <laughs> Thank you, Luigi. Thank you. <laughs> what happens now if we leave, Andrea? Does it stop? I, I have no idea. I have no idea what happens if we leave. <laughs> <laughs> Very exciting stuff. Just leave. Just leave. <laughs> okay. We've been Is given permission. All right. Bye, oh, guys. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, See you later. Bye. Bye. I had the same feeling in the in the <laughs> earlier session. All right. Thank yourself. you. See you later, Marcel. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, bye-bye, good day.